is IFBB Figure Pro Heather Dees, and I love my Species ISO bag. If you want to be like me, go to speciesnutrition.com and order yours today. the RX Muscle Studios in Westbury, New York. This is the debut episode of Ask Dave or hashtag Ask Dave. This show, as we've been promoting for weeks now, is about you, our RxMuscle.com community, the bodybuilding and fitness world. This is going to be a 30-minute question and answer session with Dave Palumbo. So you have any questions, be it workout questions, diet, supplementation, life, anything. Dave is here to answer your questions. We've had such great interaction on the RX Muscle forums, and we figured why not bring it to life here on RX Television. We are sponsored, as always, by Species Nutrition. Go to www.speciesnutrition.com as we now bring in the man himself, Dave Palumbo. Dave, this show has been long awaited, long in the making. We are finally here, a chance for you to share your wealth of knowledge with the RX Muscle community. Well, you know, it really stemmed from my laziness to not want to go in the forums and, and type all my answers to all the amazing questions I always get on a daily basis. And let's face it, not only do I get the questions on the forum, people email me directly questions, and I try to answer everyone's questions all the time. Uh, Chris Aceto and I do a Ask Dave segment on the Heavy Muscle Radio Show every Monday night, which is very popular. And I said, you know what? There's so many questions, and I know people love the Q&A thread that we do. I used to do all the time on the, on the site, and I just didn't have time to sit there and type. Because I'm a neurotic. I have to type it. It has to read well. I'd rather speak it. So now that I got you here to field all the questions for me, let's get to it. And I will answer, like I said, any questions people have. Uh, you know, I get all walks of life. I get people asking me about, you know, cats and dog help. <laughs> I get people asking me about relationship advice, which you know I may or may not have some good uh, good advice for you. I don't know. It depends on you know, uh, I guess who you are and what you want to hear. And but I try to give the truth and I try to give my truth, and that's really what it's about. All right, so let's get started again. If you have a question, you can tweet your question using the hashtag Ask Dave, or you can go to the Muscle Central Forum on rxmuscle.com. It is free to register, and you can ask your question on the hashtag Ask Dave thread. Here we go. We are going to start with the Muscle Central Forum. This one from Aceteals93. Dave, at what cumulative daily dose does caffeine become toxic to one's health? Now, the term toxic is very variable. You have to understand because certain people can tolerate a lot of caffeine. Some people can't. I'm the kind of guy that if you slip a shot of caffeine into my coffee, you know, in the morning and into my decaffeinated, decaffeinated coffee, that is, um, I'll be climbing the walls. So the more caffeine you take in on a daily basis, the more you can, you can handle it because your body acclimates to it. The problem is that while your nervous system acclimates, meaning it's not going to stimulate you, your nervous system anymore, your heart and blood pressure and all that stuff continue to rise. So the more you take, obviously, the worse it gets. Obviously, also, the more caffeine and the more stimulants you take on a daily basis, the, the, the higher your catabolic, or I should say, catabolic, catabolic hormones will, will rise in the body. And those are the hormones, you know, you know mostly known as cortisol. Um, there's different derivatives of those cortisol hormones, but cortisol is a stress hormone. When you raise cortisol, what happens in your body? Your immune system gets suppressed. It eats up muscle tissue. You get abdominal fat deposition. So we don't want to overstimulate the body. Obviously, also too many stimulants obviously causes anxiety, trouble sleeping, high blood pressure. Uh, high heart rate, and you know these are things that are not good. Now, for me, that could occur at 100 milligrams a day, which is a cup of coffee. For you know, you Sid, it might happen at 300 or 400 milligrams per day. So there's really no definitive, uh, I guess you could say, answer to the question, other than the fact that the less caffeine you consume per day, the better off and the healthier you'll be. I can guarantee you that. As a bodybuilder, you really don't want to be taking in a lot of caffeine if you're trying to build muscle. Okay, that's. Stimulants in general are not good for muscle building. Now, I understand when you're dieting for competition, a lot of times, you know, caffeine will help you get through a workout. It'll ha help you stay awake. It'll give you a little energy boost. I personally would limit yourself to two to three cups of coffee the most per day. Well, thanks to Dave here at the RX Muscle Studio. Most of the coffee supply 
is decaf, so you'll often find us in a cranky mood. Second question is also from Deals 93 This is a good one. This is a tough one. Do you find any truth to Dan Duchesne's theory of post-AR receptor-mediated growth? Well, I guess it's important to first define exactly what that is. Uh, Dan Duchesne, the late Dan Duchesne, the steroid guru, as everyone knew him, he had this theory that if you took super, super, super high amounts of anabolic steroids, like above the order of what you know normal people would take, I guess just for muscle growth, that you might get some super physiological effect. You know, uh, in other words, you get massive amounts of muscle gains as opposed to just you know excellent amounts of muscle gains. Now, it's important to understand what steroids do. First of all, they st steroids kind of enter the muscle cell through the cell membrane. They don't require receptors because they're fat soluble. Uh, hormones. They go to the nuclear receptor, the nucleus of the muscle cell, which is the brain of the muscle cell, and they tell the cell, produce more protein, make more uh, muscle fibers, or increase the, the size of the muscle fibers. Um, now, normal testosterone in a man's body will tell the body to do that to a certain degree, but when you take like, you know, 500, 600, 700, 800, 1,000 milligrams of testosterone a week, you get what's called a pharmacological effect. And that's what most bodybuilders experience from steroidal use. Uh, pharmacological meaning that you get a, a above and beyond uh, effect on muscle growth. It's, it's something more than you would see physiologically normally occurring in the body. And that's why guys on anabolic steroids and, ster and testosterone build a lot of muscle. His theory was if you take like massive amounts, like 4,000 milligrams a week, 5,000 milligrams, which is absolutely ludicrous in my mind, you'll get even, you'll get another exponential level of muscle growth. And I, you know what, I've seen guys doing that nowadays. I, back in the 90s, no one did that. But I've seen guys do that. They, it doesn't happen. You don't get the massive amounts of muscle growth. You get excessive fluid retention. You get a lot of side effects. You get a lot of toxicity. You get people feeling really bad because what happens is the immune system starts attacking these molecules because there's just too much in the body. And I, I do not agree with his theory on that. I think it was excessive. I don't think it was ever truly tested. And I think it has been tested a lot in our society today because a lot of bodybuilders do take high, high amounts. And I don't see the, the I don't see the additional muscle gains uh, that he was claiming that would happen uh, if it did work. We'd see a lot more muscle today, and we don't see guys that are much bigger today than than they were in the '90s. So I have to say that I don't agree with it. You're watching Ask Dave on <clears throat> RxMuscle.com. If you have any questions, tweet them using hashtag Ask Dave or post your questions in the Muscle Central forum uh, in the Ask Dave thread. We're going to go now to It's Me, Your Boy, this one from the Muscle Central Forum. Dave, this is an uh, area near and dear to you. What percentage of omega-3s do you like as part of a growing bodybuilder's dietary fats? He says, I've heard up to 60% of essential fatty acid omega-3s for intense trainers. Well, you got to remember, essential fatty acids are also known as polyunsaturated fats, okay? Those are, these are the fatty acids that the body cannot produce on their own. You can't synthesize these on your own. They're essential because you must consume them in your diet. Now, a lot of people think that you should take more omega-3s than 6s because the American diet is so devoid of omega-3 and is so high in omega-6. Why are we devoid in omega-3? Well, because we feed the animals all the wrong things. When, when you know cows eat grass, they produce omega-3 fats from them. However, we don't feed cows grass in this country. We feed them corn to make them fatter, which means they produce a higher percentage of omega-6 fats in their, in their body. And those omega-6 fats are what we call pro-inflammatory. They incite inflammation. They're not healthy for your heart. Um, same thing with salmon. If you eat wild salmon, you have a tremendously high amount of omega-3 fats in, in the salmon. If you, if you eat farm-raised salmon, which they feed like corn to and, and other terrible things, uh, the omega-3 content is much lower. So how much should you, you supplement with? Well, I believe that if you take in the right amount of fats, okay, and the right kind of fats, you can almost supplement on a one-to-one -one basis. I always skew a little bit in higher of omega-3s, but not by much. Ideally, for bodybuilders and guys, unless you're like weigh 600 pounds, which you probably, and there's probably no one out there that does that, probably about three grams or 3,000 milligrams of fish oil per day is ideal. And about 2,600 milligrams of primrose, evening primrose oil, which contains gamma linoleic acid, which is the essential omega-6 fat that's very healthy for us. Now, a lot of people ask me, what about flaxseed oil for omega-3 content? Omega, the omega-3 content of flaxseed oil is actually higher than the omega-3 content of fish oil. The problem is that it's only the parent compound. It's alpha linolenic acid. It's not the 
active usable form of omega-3s and humans don't convert plant sources of omega-3 fats like flaxseed into usable form very readily. So you, mu you have to, as a human, use or consume an animal source of omega-3s because the animal has already converted it to usable form. If you buy a fish oil supplement, you'll see the content on the label will say DHA, EPA. Those are your intermediates that actually do something in the body. Uh, if you look at my uh, Omega Lies uh, formula we have from Species Nutrition, okay, uh, Omega Lies contains 3,000 milligrams of fish oil, which is the usable form of uh, omega-3 fats that we want as humans, and it contains 2,600 milligrams of evening primrose oil, which gives you your omega-6 fats, and you can see the label up there, and it actually also contains something new that we just added to the new uh, advanced formula. It contains omega-7 fats, palmitoleic acid specifically, which helps reduce total body inflammation and also makes you much more sensitive to insulin. So you guess what? You produce less insulin in your body to absorb the same amount of carbohydrates, thus you have less of a chance of getting fat. So it's a super healthy formula. That's the right ratio. If you get your three grams of fish oil and 2,600 milligrams of primrose oil every day in your diet and you always take essential fats with food, you will never have to worry. It's like kind of like your insurance policy on health on fatty acids. It's me, your boy, has another question. This one relating to the Arnold Classic, which is in 52 days. Who is your dark host? your dark horse, to shake things up at the Arnold? Um, you know, I really like Justin Compton and, and Cedric McMillan. I think they have to be the two favorites going into the show. I, I think that Compton, after winning the Orlando show last year, really established himself as, as the new guy on the block. You know, he was the dark horse last year, and he proved that, you know, he is dangerous. He's going to be hard to beat. He comes in big. He comes in hard. He comes in full. Uh, his conditioning is impeccable. He, he's got fresh, young muscle, which is tough to beat. You know, And I think that if he makes even 10% improvement over last year, he'll be very tough to beat. Obviously, Cedric McMillan has to be your favorite only because you know he's the highest placing you know, competitor in the lineup. Uh, he placed third last year. He's, got the, he's over six foot. He's got a tremendously classic physique. Arnold actually told him he was the best poser he'd ever seen uh, on, in the modern era. So that's got to help you know, count for something. Typically in the Arnold Classic, they like the classic physique, the lines of like a Cedric McMillan. If he can bring the conditioning we know he can bring, I think he'll be dangerous. Obviously, you got Dexter Jackson in the lineup. He's won four Arnolds. He ties the all-time record with Flex Wheeler. He's got to be considered a guy that if someone, a lot, these other two guys are a little off, he can sneak in there and win. It's funny because Dexter's always the dark horse candidate, and he's probably one of the most decorated bodybuilders, you know, in bodybuilding. He's won four Arnold Classics. He's won a Mr. Olympia contest. He's got over 20 professional wins in his career. And at 45 years old, he's still very dangerous. We now move over to another Muscle Central Forum user, Bill2. For a bodybuilder not interested in competition, but interested uh, to build fat-free mass and be healthy for all their lives, what kind of AAS regimen would you recommend? Dosages, duration on and off, and what kind of drugs should be used? <laughs> well, you're giving me a homework assignment, and you guys know how I feel about homework. I don't like doing homework. But, you know, look, you know, if you're looking to use anabolic steroids, you know, responsibly and safely, um, obviously long-acting testosterone esters are usually the best. And, and, and I've been saying this for years, and it's pretty obvious that those are the safest because that's what they use for hormone replacement therapy. So uh, they're not going to give anything that's going to be toxic for long-term hormone replacement. Uh, if you really want to get some nice, a nice boost and, and not really have to worry about too many side effects, you should probably take at least 500 milligrams of testosterone a week. That'll give you a nice boost above and beyond what hormone replacement therapy would give you. Obviously, with, when you start boosting testosterone in the 500 milligram per week mark, you probably want to take an aromatase inhibitor, something that's that's going to inhibit estrogen production in the body because obviously if you're produ if you're turning half the testosterone you're uh, I guess injecting into estrogen then you really don't have that much testosterone to build muscle plus you're going to get estrogenic side effects like you know water retention and maybe gynecomastia and uh, lower fat deposition so probably a half a milligram of arimidex you know three times a week or every other day would probably be adequate to combine with that testosterone. Now, a lot of people like to add growth hormone with that for a little extra boost. Uh, if you did two IUs of growth hormone probably, you know, in the morning, you know, five to seven days a week, you know, during the duration of this, 
I think that that would be a, a nice, safe way and very regenerative. This is a conservative cycle, but it, it's something that can be run, you know, for longer periods of time, up to six months, probably giving yourself four to six weeks off. You know, if you're over the age of 35 and you, and you want to stay in hormone replacement, you could probably segue right into a, a 200 or 100 milligram per week dose of testosterone, you know, uh, as a kind of like a maintenance phase in between your, your, your cycles you would do. And I think that that would probably be a healthy way to go as long as your blood pressure is under control and, you know, your heart rate is good and you go for, you know, physicals and check your blood work. I, I don't see why you can't do this for extended periods of time. We stay in the Muscle Central Forum. Again, if you want to ask your questions, you can tweet using hashtag AskDave or you can register for free in the Muscle Central Forum on rxmuscle.com. We have a live thread going right now for Ask Dave. This one coming from user Juggies. He's actually asked seven questions, so let's hammer them out. The first one, why do low-fat diets work so well for people? Does it really matter if you go low-carb or low-fat? Well, there's been a lot of research to show that low-fat diets are not really the best diets to lose weight. Because let's face it, when you're trying to lose body fat, you're pretty much eliminating one macro, you know, of the protein, fat, and, and, and carbs. Uh, protein can never really be lowered because we know we need protein to, you know, to, to maintain muscle mass and to recover from workouts and to you know, give your body all the raw materials it needs for hair and nails and skin and uh, enzyme production, hormone production. So we're really looking at should we eliminate fat or should we eliminate carbs? Um, if you eliminate fat, you're, you're eliminating something that your body needs because there's something called essential fatty acids, which we just talked about before, your omega-6s, your omega-3s. Obviously, the heart-healthy monounsaturated fats like olive oil, macadamia nut oil, those are also really necessary in the diet too. So if you start getting rid of those, your body's going to sense that it's in what we call a fat-deprived state, and invariably, your body will start hoarding body fat. Uh, now, if you eat carbs... If you, excuse me, if you get rid of fat and you eat carbs, you know, carbs cause insulin release. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. In fact, it's the only fat storage hormone in the body. So um, you're going to create an environment if you're eating carbs and low fat that is really more conducive to fat storing than fat burning. Um, the reason why some people will lose fat or lose body weight uh, on a low fat diet is because their calories are really low. But as bodybuilders, you don't really want to go low calories because if you go too low calories, you can risk losing muscle, obviously. So, um, you know, you can't really look at the diet of a Phil Heath or a Mr. Olympia who can pretty much eat whatever they want, you know, uh, and, and lose weight. You got to remember, these guys are not eating low calorie diets. They might be eating higher carbs than the average person, but they're still eating a significant amount of food in their diet. And they eat so much protein, too, that you got to remember, they get a lot, of a lot of dietary fat just from the protein sources they're eating, red meat, chicken, and, and, and the like, salmon. So uh, for the average person, if you want to lose weight, the best way would be to cut carbs back and, and to keep fat moderate. And when I say moderate, I'm talking about a, gram, a half a gram of fat per pound that you weigh per day. Next question also from Juggies. How often should bodybuilder competitors change their injectable cycle compounds? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, uh, most bodybuilders will, will structure their anabolic steroid cycles with testosterone with another anabolic agent. And most, most people who, who do, do, I guess you could say, growth type cycles or contest you know, cycles will go anywhere from 16 to 24 weeks you know, on, on a cycle. And, you know, what I have found that is that testosterone pretty much is testosterone, whether you use a cypionate or an anthate or propionate, ester or sustanon, they're all pretty much the same. They don't really kind of, you don't really get used to one or another. What you get used to is kind of the anabolic agent. So usually people will switch up, you know, equipoise for trenbolone, for uh, de uh, decadurabolin, for masteron. And it's usually a good idea every six to eight weeks to switch your anabolic compounds. What are your thoughts, Dave, on intra-workout supplements? And he puts in parentheses, plasma and intra-MD. Um, I'm, if anyone knows, I've talked about this many times before, I think that intra-workout supplements are ridiculous. They're, they're just a waste. I mean, if you take a good pre-workout meal or, or shake and a good post-workout meal or shake, I mean, do you really need to eat or consume something during the workout. I mean, unless you, you're exercising for six hours, there's you don't you know, and you're you know, and the only people who do that are cyclists. You know, uh, there's really no reason to do an intra-workout you know type of nutritional uh, supplement. Think about it. You know, when you're working out in in a weight room or you're doing and even cardio for that matter, you're all the blood you know, that your body has is in the muscles working. You don't want to have to distract the blood from the muscles into your stomach to try to absorb some kind of nutrition that you're consuming. 
invariably what, ha what happens is the people who drink these intra workout shakes, especially the concentrated ones that have a lot of nutrition in them, what happens is they lay in your stomach and they don't even get absorbed until after the workout's over because then the blood leaves the muscles and goes into the organs of, of digestion. Did you ever wonder why you don't have to pee you know, or go to the bathroom very much when you're exercising, it's because all the blood shunts itself away from the kidneys. The kidneys are not even filtering blood while you're working out very much because the blood is in the muscles. So use a good pre-workout, use a good post-workout shake, but the, the intra-workout is, is a total marketing scam. It's just companies trying to sell you more product and yet let you spend even more money. There's no reason why you would be run short of, you know, protein, amino acids, you know, carbohydrates if you're consuming enough, you know, pre-workout. Now, having said that, some guys, you know, sometimes their blood sugar drops a little while they're working out. If you want to sip a Gatorade or you want to sip some coconut water or a dilute sugar drink while you're working out, that's fine because as long as it's dilute enough, mostly water, then your body can absorb that. That's a, more of a fluid replacement drink. Can or should insulin be used without HGH? Um, Personally, most people who take insulin exogenously, in other words, additional insulin to try to put muscle on, because let's face it, insulin is an anabolic hormone. It drives, and what's the definition of an anabolic hormone? Well, an anabolic hormone is anything that drives nutrients into the muscle cell. The problem is that if you take too much insulin and the muscle cells fill up with nutrients, the additional calories or the additional nutrients go into the fat cells and become fat. So insulin is not only an anabolic hormone, it's a fat storing hormone. So for most people, when they take insulin without anything else, they usually get fat from it, that's all. Or they hold water, and they think they're bigger, but they're really just fatter. Um, some people who take growth hormone, however, become what's called insulin resistant, because growth hormone is a mobilizing hormone. It moves nutrition out of the muscles, or I should say out of the fat cells. It's a, it, it helps you know, burn fat. It helps create an environment that's conducive to loss, not gain, uh, although, you know, growth hormone post-workout, you know, or after it exerts its effects, will then have an anabolic effect. So growth hormone has two effects. But what it does is it can make you insulin resistant, which means that your body might not effectively absorb all the calories that you're eating. So a lot of guys who take growth hormone will supplement with insulin to help them absorb their food. However, if you're a person that tends to get fat relatively easily, you probably over-secrete insulin already. You probably shouldn't be supplementing with insulin. For people who are hard gainers, however, guys who have trouble gaining weight, who might be lean or stay lean or more most of the time, those people will benefit better from taking insulin supplementation. Dave, what are your thoughts on peptides? Which ones do you think are worth the money for bodybuilders? Um, you know, the peptide market has become huge now because, you know, it's hard to become to get anabolic steroids. They just made pro hormones illegal. Mm. And so people want to believe that there's something out there that's readily available to them that actually will do something or build a lot of muscle. You know, and I know there's a lot of people who sell peptides out there that want to make you think that they have that you gotta you gotta have every peptide in, in your medicine cabinet. And I even know people that, that, that make people believe that these peptides have magical properties. The truth of the matter is most of them are very weak. When people start asking me about GHRP6 and Iparelin or Hexarelin or all these growth hormone releasing peptides, these are the hormone, these are the peptides that actually cause the pituitary gland to release more growth hormone. You know, they say, oh, I heard this one's good and I combine these and I stack these three together. The truth is, they don't have even a fraction of the, of the, I guess, potential of taking real growth hormone because you never know how much growth hormone your body's going to release. I actually have recommended people try some of these growth hormone releasing peptides because they actually increase your appetite. And I think most people's problem with gaining weight in the offseason, they can't eat enough. So in, in essence, the GHRP6 you know, releasing peptide is actually much better as an appetite increaser than it is as a growth hormone releasing peptide. Um, having said that, probably the best growth hormone, the best peptides, the most effective muscle building ones are the uh, IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factors, specifically long R3 IGF-1, which has the longest half-life in the body. You know, 10 to 20 micrograms per day of that stuff, you know, post-workout will definitely help with recovery and muscle building. The trick is with IGF-1 is you don't want to take too much of it. If you take too much of it, it stops working right away. Likewise, you only want to do it four weeks in a row and then take a two-week break on it and go back to four weeks in a row once again or it stops working. Let's take one more from Juggies on the Muscle Central Forum. What kind of training do you recommend? Do you recommend high intensity a la Dorian Yates or high volume? Personally, I was always a Dorian Yates advocate. I, I believe that the heavy-duty you know, training, that, that is high weight, lower reps, 
lower set numbers built muscle great for me. And I think that works really well for hard gainers, people who just have super fast metabolisms. Stimulate the muscle, get out of the gym. Because otherwise, the longer I stayed in the gym, the more catabolic my body got and the harder it was for me to recover. So I also found that by taking more days off a week, you know, I used to train almost every day. And then when I found when I took two to three days off a week, I actually grew better. So, you know, you have to know your body. Some people's body, however, do respond better to higher reps and to not really to higher reps, higher volume, I should say, more sets. But you, so you got to kind of experiment. So for me to say, heavy duty, higher intensity training is the best way out there. It was the best way for me, but it might not be the best way for the next guy. So test it out. Obviously more is not always better. And a lot of times more is not good at all for bodybuilding purposes. So stimulate the muscle as Lee Haney used to say, don't annihilate it. You're watching Ask Dave on rxmuscle.com sponsored by Species Nutrition. If you want to get your question in, you can tweet using hashtag Ask Dave. You can Post on our Muscle Central forum thread. It is free to register. We have some questions also coming in on the live stream chat box. We'll address those in just a moment. We stick with the Muscle Central forum. This one, Dave, comes from Power Dome. What are the long term potential side effects of using an AI like Armidex when on HRT? Is it, it is, after all, a cancer drug? Well, you know, I think it's important that we address that because I've heard, you know, back in the 90s, everyone used Nolvidex or Tamoxifen and everyone said, oh, it's a cancer drug. You know, women who have breast cancer, some of the breast cancers are what we call estrogen dependent breast cancers, meaning that the estrogen hormone in the woman's body will incite or, or keep the tumor from growing. It's not that the fact that estrogen causes the tumor, they get the breast tumor but it's an estrogen dependent, growth dependent tumor. So they give these women estrogen blockers. They used to give Nolvidex or Tamoxifen to block estrogen receptors so that the receptors on the tumor cells, it wouldn't, they wouldn't grow. Then they gave Arimidex when they came out with that, which actually inhibited conversion of testosterone into estrogen, which was only really significant in women who are postmenopausal because most women produce their estrogen directly from the ovaries. So this is how they got the stigma of being cancer drugs. But in a man's body, what they will do is tamoxifen will block estrogen receptors and prevent estrogenic side effects, and Arimidex will prevent the testosterone that the male produces from converting into estrogen to begin with. So it'll lower testosterone levels. So it doesn't really have long-term side effects because it's not really a specific cancer drug. It's an anti-estrogen drug, and, and that's really the truth of the matter. Now, some of these anti-estrogen drugs, they lower estrogen so much they can affect uh, negatively affect cholesterol profiles. So you don't want to take too much of it. Once again, you need a little estrogen for sex drive sensitization, for androgen receptor sensitization so you can grow. And actually, you know, some of the estrogen is necessary also to keep your cholesterol profiles, you know, adequate. Again, you're watching Ask Dave on rxmuscle.com, brought to you by Species Nutrition. We now say hello to our audience on the live stream chat box. Tom Ramsey chimes in. Dave, he asks your thoughts on chiropractic treatment for bodybuilders. Well, uh, bodybuilders, you know, there's a lot of Bibles that are chiropractors, and I've gone to many of them. My good friend Darlene Castro has been treating me for years. I think chiropractic is great because it helps, you know, realign the spine. It keeps the muscles working. And, you know, a lot of chiropractors do a lot of tissue work too, which is important. Uh, my friend Darlene does uh, – ART or active release techniques and, and what that does is it kind of realigns the muscles it removes scar tissue and, and adhesions from the muscle and it actually helps his adjustment because when you adjust someone and their muscles are out of alignment the adjustment doesn't stick it kind of goes right back to what it was before when you first when you first fix the muscle so to speak with the ART and get rid of these adhesions and then you adjust the muscle the adjustment sticks so i'm a huge believer in chiropractic and art and tissue work even massage was very important when i was competing i used to get a massage every week we got a good question on twitter so i'm going to save this one until the very end it's one that i'm sure is going to be very near and dear to you dave but we stick with the muscle central forum on rxmuscle.com and we go to ash belg or belg 09 I've been dealing with estrogen dominance my whole life, and it's making prepping for my shows very difficult. When it comes uh, time for that, major water retention and cellulite on the back of my legs and glutes. Any advice with training or diet that would help? You really can't control estrogen so much with diet. I know people will say don't eat soy foods because soy causes increased estrogen. Some people just tend to aromatize or convert more testosterone into estrogen than other people. 
and those people will suffer more of this estrogenic side effects. And that's just the way it goes. Usually people that hold more body fat tend to have more estrogen in their body because the fat cells are where the aromatase enzyme really kind of hangs out. So if you really want to limit these estrogenic side effects, you got to take something that's going to block estrogen. The best thing as a man to do would be to take a little Arimidex or Femara or Aromacin. These are all aromatase inhibitors. They inhibit the enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. Um, I've always found good results with Arimidex at a half a milligram every other day. A lot of guys prefer Femara at 2.5 milligrams every other day. Some people try Aromacin at 25 milligrams every other day. But uh, give it a shot and see if it eliminates some of your problems. I think that that's, that's probably going to be your best bet. We got a few more questions. I want to try to nail each and every one of them before time runs out. This one from Iron Brian 82 I've been on and off steroids, HEH, etc., for 10 years, always doing a four week uh, PCT at the end of my cycle. My question is uh, me and my missus are looking to have a baby, but there seems to be bodybuilders with only girls, but we both want a boy. Is there a reason all bodybuilders have girls? And if so, is there a way to have a boy? <laughs> well, you know, nowadays I hear you can go to the uh, these fertility specialists and they could spin your sperm down and they could actually pick the sex. So I think the male sperm fall to the bottom, the female rise to the top, or maybe it's vice versa. You know, with reptiles, if you incubate the eggs at a higher at a higher um, temperature, you can produce males over females. Uh, as far as I know, other than, you know, doing some kind of, you know, daily prayer, I don't know if you can really pick <laughs> it yourself, but it is, it is an interesting phenomenon. I have seen a lot of female born to bodybuilders, especially bodybuilders that had used anabolic steroids. But, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. I, I don't know what it is. It, it, it is an interesting phenomenon, however. I, I, I'm Right now, I'm in the process of trying to, you know, have kids myself, so it'll be interesting to see if I have a girl over a boy. This next one from Mac, he has two questions, both relating to HRT, so we'll just ask it as a two-parter. First part, what advice can you give older bodybuilders about HRT? And then second, what is your current HRT, and has it been effective as you hoped? Mm -hmm. Um, for older people, I think that the hormone replacement protocol is pretty much standard for everyone, whether you're 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 even. Uh, my dad's even on hormone replacement at 85. So, you know, usually about 100 milligrams per week gives you really, you know, a higher normal physiological level. Most bodybuilders prefer 200 milligrams of hormone replacement per week because it gives you a little bit more of a boost. It, it puts you at the very high level, high top level of the physiological range. So you'll see a lot of bodybuilders using 200 milligrams. It's pretty safe to go from 100 to 200 milligrams per week. Um, you could actually put some good muscle on to 200 milligrams per week, believe it or not. So, uh, but you know, if you have, if it's your dad and he doesn't really work out that much, probably 100 milligrams per week is adequate. And usually you combine that with maybe a little bit of an aromatase inhibitor, maybe a half a milligram twice a week of Arimidex. Uh, that's standard. A lot of times these doctors like to put in a little HCG too. While it's not necessary, it can't really hurt. If you did 500 milligrams a week or 500 milligrams twice a week, you probably wouldn't notice much more, but you might, you might feel your testicle size might not shrink as much and you might feel you know, that it looks cosmetically better. I don't know. To me, it never really mattered, but uh, usually 100 to 200 milligrams a week. We're getting some uh, some heat right now, some really good questions on Twitter. Again, if you have any questions and you want to tweet it at us, tweet using hashtag AskDave. This one coming from at D-I-G-A-S-S-A-D-O, Diga or Dija. Uh, apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. This is a good one. They with the current finances of the main magazines, what is the future of IFBB Pro Contracts? You know, it, it, they look dim. You know, it's, it goes back to the old joke, why cut back? You know, but, you know, everyone is cutting back because the money is not there and uh, magazines are not selling like they used to. People are not advertising in magazines as they used to. So the, the, the finances coming into these magazines, you got to remember, you know, some of these magazines were 500 pages back in the day and half of those were ads. You know, if you're paying $2,000 an ad, that's a lot of money that these magazines were generating and they had the money to, sp to have the sponsored athletes. And I just see, you know, with... People like Steve Blackman cutting back, you know, all his athletes. Um, I have to assume that these magazines are in trouble. We've been predicting this for years now, and, uh, you know, we're just starting to really see it, you know, surfacing this past year. I think by next year, 
We're going to see maybe almost no exclusive contracts, probably just maybe Mr. Olympia, the top, top guys in the world. And you know what? It'll actually turn out to be better for these other guys, these guys that are not Mr. Olympia, because they'll be able to basically interview with everyone and, and make themselves more widely available you know, to do more social media marketing of themselves, you know, more magazine marketing, more digital magazine marketing. And I think that's invariably going to make them more money. Now, I didn't want to avoid the other question that you had asked me before. Someone had asked me about my own personal hormone replacement use, and I forgot to mention that uh, or, or mention what, what I was taking. I was on about 100 milligrams. Per, I was been taking 200 milligrams per week for a number of years. And I went down to 100 because I, I noticed that I really didn't need the 200. And I wasn't really looking to gain weight. And I was having trouble because I was putting muscle on it at an accelerated rate. So I went down to 100 for a while. The last six months, I haven't taken any, to be honest with you, because I've been trying to get my wife pregnant. So what I did was I went on an HCG, HMG regimen. Uh, I've been on that, trying to boost natural levels and, and, and natural sperm production. So, uh, And I haven't felt bad. So obviously, the PCT type of, of I guess you could say hormone replacement really does work. It's just got to be administered way more frequently every other day, so it's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, but I feel good, and that, that's what it's all about. It's, it's how you feel. If you feel good, then you know your hormone levels are adequate. And when I go for blood work, my, I'm, in, I'm in a normal range. I'm not in a high range when I'm off hormone replacement, but I'm in a normal range. Again, you're watching Ask Dave on RxMuscle.com, sponsored by Species Nutrition. Visit www.speciesnutrition.com. Dot com. We have time for one more question, Dave. This is a good one from our Twitter feed. Uh, again, uh, users tweeting their questions with the hashtag AskDave. Who were your idols growing up and who are your current idols now? You know, it's an interesting question because I was the guy who watched Pumping Iron and rooted for Lou Ferrigno rather than Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know why. I just like because I was like an incredible Hulk fan. I used to, as a kid, I loved that show. I watched it. I, I was I fantasized about being it. I used to imitate him. And ironically, I, I got to play the Incredible Hulk uh, in, in a comedy sense on the Conan O'Brien show for many years. Over the course of ten years, I think I must have done it about maybe ten or twelve times. I, I depicted the part. They painted me green. But so I was always a Ferrigno fan. And it, it, I, every time I watch Pumping Iron, I always think he's going to win. Like, I'm always rooting for him, you know, like, he, like he's going to win, even though I know Arnold won. So I was, that was kind of like an idol of mine growing up. When I was, became a bodybuilder and was competing, I really looked up to Dorian Yates a lot. I, I wanted to be like him. And, and he, when he was the first guy to really hit 300 pounds off season at 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 you know, I really said, I want to do that next. And I think I might have been, you know, at least close to one of the next guys doing that. So that was one of the guys that I looked up to. Nowadays, I, I, you know, I don't really have idols. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting I kind of hit the point where I'm no longer like kind of like um, I guess you could say um, starstruck. No, I'm not. I, I'm kind of like the I'm the role model now. I've I've kind of put myself out there as the, the teacher, so to speak. And although I have my own teachers, Wayne Dyer is a guy I do read a lot of his books, and I look up to him. And you know, I've gotten into reptiles lately, breeding snakes and stuff like that. And so I kind of like I'm kind of like I read all the guys who who are into that. So I kind of like look at the Dave Palumbo's of the reptile world. But as far as bodybuilding, you know, idols go, I, I respect what Arnold does, obviously, and I can respect you know what's what some of the you know supplement company owners have done. And you know, I'm more of a businessman, so I look to, look to that. And I try to emulate that about them. But you know. I try to hold myself out as a role model myself now. And, and, you know, that's tough because people will judge everything you do, you know, and they'll judge your past even though your past is not what you do now. So, you know, I'm always constantly trying to reinvent myself. And, and, and really that's, that's, that's the role model that I look for. I'm trying to be better than I was before. Well, that's going to do it for the first episode of Ask Dave. We had a lot of fun. Dave, again, we got so much participation from the Muscle Central Forum, from our fans on Twitter, from our fans on the Facebook page, and the live chat stream. So this is something that I think was long awaited and, you know, again, provided a forum for you to give your wealth of knowledge back to the community. I loved it. I love doing this. I love being a provider of information. I love teaching. Uh, you know, I love answering everyone's questions. This is a much easier format for me because I can speak freely. I don't have to like sit down and a lot time and you know start writing stuff out that takes a long time and takes time out of my day. So you know, I encourage you guys. Look, I'm giving you the ability to ask your questions, to have your questions answered live here. Um, I'm willing to spend the time. I want to educate people. It's important that people know how to do things correctly so that they don't hurt themselves, they don't harm themselves, and that they live a healthy, happy, and enjoyable life. And, and that's what really life is all about. A lot of people think there's a special meaning behind it. I think it's about enjoying yourself. And if you can enjoy yourself and do the things you really love and, and make money from it and be safe and happy about it, then, hey, you got the best life around.
A day before we go, in about an hour's time, Heavy Muscle TV, big episode tonight. IFBB Pro Jason Poston on the show tonight. How about you tell the fans about that? Jason Poston loves coming on Heavy Muscle Radio. He li and, you know, we, we have a good rapport because I, I know him and I know how to get ex extract out of him, you know, the information that he's got inside him. And we have a good time and he's a good sport. He's very knowledgeable. He's very dedicated to the sport. You know, there's not many men's physique guys out there that I really respect. He's one of them, Sadiq Hodzovic being another guy that I, I truly respect. And, uh, you know, I'm happy that he likes to come on the show and, and, and provide information. We also have uh, Holt McCallan, McCalloway, right? McCallany. Yeah. And, you know, I, I didn't really know who he was until you kind of brought him up to me. But then I started looking and I realized that I love a lot of his movies he's been in. <laughs> I've been watching them over the last 15 or 20 years. So it's a kind of exciting to get a little bit of a celebrity on the show. And uh, we'll get to ask him some of the questions about what new stuff he's got coming out. I saw he's got a new uh, series with Rob Lowe coming out. Yeah, he's got that coming out. He's got a couple of projects that we cannot talk about right oh, really? now at this moment. But also, he was on Fight Club, and that's another thing that that's we, I know I saw that. It was crazy. We can't talk about it. We can't talk about it. Why? First rule about Fight Club. Don't talk, don't about, talk Fight about Fight Club. Fight Club. So we have that. A lot of exciting things coming up tonight on Heavy Muscle TV. Eugene Mission, our very own RX Muscle resident, Rad Russian, Eugene Mission. That and a whole lot more. Eight thirty. Heavy Muscle TV. We'll be back next week on Ask Dave. Again, if you want to keep your questions rolling in, we'll be sure to get them on the next show. For now, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. Have a good day.